the heart of creativity, a lot of innovations and new ideas, <clears throat> and in fact, inventions that we enjoy today are based on the ideas of previous people that were elaborated on and recreated, improved. So many of the inventions that we enjoy in our homes, the technology, is just building on someone else's idea. In language production, is the ability to avoid simplistic utterances, playing it safe. We left. We went on the weekend. It was nice. I liked it. My dad liked it. He said it was nice. That lack of elaborative skills, yeah? Elaboration skills. So the avoidance of simplistic responses, improving, embellishing our talk, is really great and it's a great addition to language production. It's particularly useful for writing. Uh, it's the time when the students will have more time available to them in processing, producing speech, to improve it, to edit it, to elaborate, to embellish it. And finally, originality. In the creative world, it's the ability to produce uncommon, clever ideas. But in language talk, we don't need to be common and clever. We just need to avoid the cliché. Uh, it, it's good for the soul, it's maybe not good for the hips, but it's good for the, your general demeanor. It makes me, and I recently read some research that people who eat ice cream for breakfast in the morning, they wake up and they're lively and they're ready. Yes. Uh, ice cream stands and bites of ice cream. Do you have a bite, by the way? Because I read a lot of cycling and I do it all the time. It is also very good for your health. You are a health freak, I realize, but there's some ice cream that doesn't have sugar in it and you can buy sugarizing ice cream. So you don't need to ride a bike every time to burn off those calories. But you can eat ice cream with uh, maybe stevia instead of sugar or other sweeteners. Okay, do you see how it works? So she didn't interrupt me, she just added on something. Well done, thank you so much. Why are you asking? Uh, isn't it obvious that I'm interested? <laughs> this is where we kind of block up. But it's very flexible thinking to try and find another question. To answer your question, and it's quite demanding. We need practice. Everybody needs practice. It doesn't come easy. But those kinds of ideas, it's very, very simple ideas that generate a lot of talk. <laughs> I'm just going to rush through some of the activities that teenagers might like. Um, these are typical activities you might find in a course book where people would say, oh, you know, you can get your hair fixed at the hairdresser's room. <gasps> okay, uh, who cares? But if you give this to teenagers and you say, make some crazy sentences, and they say things like maybe, um, you can have your feet enlarged at the hairdresser's and draw a silly picture. I mean, they will enjoy it more, and it's more memorable to them than the boring sense. So, um, paradoxical, crazy sentences. Um, predicaments is another great activity. Um, giving someone a predicament and putting them on the spot. And say, explain yourself. You were seen chewing the corner of a carpet. Why were you doing that? And then later on, each team can write predicaments to send to the other team and challenge them. You were seen walking down near the street with a, um, you know, shopping bag on your head. Why were you doing that? Or you were seen gluing apples to a tree outside your house at midnight. Why were you doing that? There's some great uh, creative ideas that can be generated from that. One of my students said, you know, we rented my house to a filming company and they gave us a lot of money and they needed an apple tree and we didn't have one. And I thought that was really creative. Then you can get the learners to write their own predicaments and put the spot. 
This one was created by a group of my trainees. Don't just stand there, get me another pillow. I think that's, this is very simple. The, uh, remember, the prompt doesn't need to be verbal, it needs to be visual, and it can generate a lot of language. Uh, we did unusual uses at the beginning with, and here are some of the objects that you can use in class very easily. They can be classroom objects, or you can bring a strange object yourself. I think um, just going uh, very uh, briefly into the realm of uh, critical thinking, uh, you know about balloon debates, and uh, they are usually they usually involve people. In some cases, I have found this a little bit heartless. So you can replace people with ideas. For example, you have 20 toys. Which 10 toys would you keep? Or which 5 toys would you keep? Because you're beginning to lose height. Or it could be objects. Or it could be a list of items necessary for survival. And you could ask people, your class, to choose. So we go into, you're beginning to go into the area of problem solving. I had some politicians here. And with my own training teachers, we sometimes put names like Chomsky, uh, Stephen Krasher, and so on as, you know, but which uh, when we revise our approaches. But I would never tell Scott Thornbury that we put his name up there, he wouldn't like it. He is taken from, Ed, um, I think, Tony Buzan's um, website or book. And it's the six thinking hats, and you might enjoy trying that with your classes. Um, this, the, oh no, it's Edward de Bono, sorry, it's not Buzza. Uh, I've got my own reference. So you give the learners uh, in groups a different thinking hat each, <coughs> and the function of each hat, you will very quickly see, is different. And when you give them a topic for discussion or a problem to solve, each time you can change the thinking hat that you give them. And the thinking hats are uh, the white one, the person who gathers the data and information, 